think that he's becoming overly political, and if there's one thing they don't like and won't tolerate, it's politics and uh, mixing with their religion. Um, <laughs> but Chip Smith had uh, a great quote on Fox News. Uh, he's the reasonable one uh, most of the time. And he said that what the Pope is doing and what he's speaking out about poverty and about the refugee crisis and about uh, immigration and all these topics, climate change, he is not being political, and he's not speaking about politics necessarily. He is basically expressing the real-world application of very basic and generalized values about protecting the people who need protection, about being good stewards of the earth, all that stuff. When you get into exactly how to deal with the refugee crisis, okay, then you're talking about politics. But him simply saying that we have a responsibility as humans to protect these humans who are going through some version of hell on Earth, that is not politics. That is that is simply straight talk about values that we should all share. Yeah, but I would counter ship with this. Shame. 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 <laughs> yeah, you didn't think about that, did you, Chef? <laughs> <laughs> it's become like a rap thing. Yeah, I kind of like it, actually. I like the remix. Something, man. It's something. Anyway, yeah. I like this uh, quote, though. The other day on Twitter, not the other day, yesterday, and I know who you are, but I'm, I, I, in case you don't want it out there, I'm not going to say your name. You know, we were talking about uh, masturbation and uh, who masturbates to me. Not a big deal. Because obviously, start talking about the women of uh, the uh, TYT. We we're talking about in the post game, hell of a post game. Become a member this month. You wait. We we're talking about the female employees of TYT, like how guys who oh yeah, I do this. I oh, do that. Okay, okay, right, right. So, uh, so tytnetwork.com slash subscribe to become a member, and um, and then apparently there is a very very small community of uh, gay viewers who enjoy. Uh, me, or however they enjoy me. <laughs> there are four ways. <laughs> <laughs> and they are called, uh, they call themselves, at least according to one person, uh, Jankosexuals. Oh, I thought you were going to call them the Jankoffs. Oh, yeah. uh, oh Jankosexuals. That's, that's, yeah. that's a good team name. <laughs> um, anyway. Jankosexuals. Wow. Uh, so this woman came and said, look, it's not just the guys. When you talk Spanish on air, you know, I, I go to work. And I was like, I didn't know that. Who knew that? I almost never talk Spanish. I wonder if my, the reason I brought that up now, I was wondering if my southern accent does anything for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me uncomfortable. Panties <laughs> <laughs> are dropping all over the nation. <laughs> anyway, I I'd like to say, Yeah, that's was macho. Ricardo Mandovan or Emilio Estevez. <laughs> there were twists in there. Jesus there were twists in there. Okay, okay, ladies, hold off on the masturbation. We got an important story here about Ben Carson. All right. Okay, let's talk about him. Aside from his interesting views on Muslim candidates running for the presidency, Ben Carson has largely been successful over the past, especially the past few months, but even the past few years, in gathering together and putting together this image of him being a very likable, very reasonable person, not necessarily driven by any sort of extreme philosophy. That sort of image is not going to bear up to the scrutiny that you will have after you watch this speech he gave back in 2012 where he talks about the Big Bang Theory. Now what about the Big Bang Theory? I, I find the Big Bang really quite fascinating. I mean, here you have all these highfalutin scientists, and they're saying that there was this gigantic explosion and everything came into perfect order. Now, these are the same scientists who go around touting the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy, which says that things move toward a state of disorganization. So now you're going to have this big explosion, and everything becomes perfectly organized. And when you ask them about it, they say, well, we can explain this based on probability theory, because... If there's enough big explosions over a long enough period of time, over billions and billions of years, one of them will be the perfect explosion. And and I say, so what you're telling me is if I blow a hurricane through a junkyard enough times, over billions and billions of years, eventually after one of those hurricanes, there'll be a 747 fully loaded and ready to fly. Well, but I mean, it's even more ridiculous than that because our solar system, not to mention
attention, the universe outside of that is extraordinarily well organized to the point where we can predict 70 years away when a comet is coming. Now, that type of organization to just come out of an explosion? I mean, you want to talk about fairy tales. That is amazing. That was amazing. So when you're a neurosurgeon, and a very famous one at that, well before you ran for president, it's amazing that you could call people highfalutin scientists. I know. You have lost when you say highfalutin. Yeah. I mean, on that phrase alone, okay, please stop, <laughs> please stop, please stop, right? So I'm actually, the funny thing is, though, we're going to get to his views on evolution, which I find uh, far more offensive, ridiculous, and, and amusing. Hmm. Uh, on the Big Bang, look, I think the Big Bang's a, it's more of a, it's a newer theory, uh, it's harder for people to wrap their minds around it, and so this whole 747 thing is nonsense, that's not what they're talking about, that's not the right analogy, etc. But I'm, I'm not freaked out that a Republican presidential candidate or someone who might be president of the United States doesn't believe in the Big Bang. I'm positive George W. Bush didn't believe in it. Yeah. So, so far, I'm not blown away. I'm blown away, not that he doesn't believe in it, but that if he's going to state why he doesn't believe in it, that he shows so how little he knows about the Big Bang and about the second law of thermodynamics there. Um, I'm going to try to be fast, because there's like 30 things I want to criticize here. I'm not going to do that, but uh, yesterday we talked about how Donald Trump had inaccurately used the talking point that in the 1920s there was this global cooling thing, when it was actually in the 1970s. Uh, here you see Ben Carson inaccurately using what is known as Hoyle's fallacy or the junkyard tornado uh, idea, not the, not the hurricane. Uh, first of all, yes, if infinite, limitless hurricanes went through a junkyard, Yes, you would get a 747. Eventually, that's it's what infinite means. parts of a 747 happen to be in that junkyard. Even if they were. You'd get something <laughs> like it. Um, uh, other things. He says that, oh, you could get, you could, you could know where a comet's going to go. Have an explosion. An explosion happens, then you know where something's going to go. Does he know how a fucking gun works? That's what a gun is. Something explodes. We know it's going to go out of that tube. And yes, if you see a comet somewhere, there's no gravity acting on it, no inertia acting on it. It's just going to continue in a straight line. It has a long way to go. Yes, over 70 years, we know where it's going to go. That has nothing to do with the Big Bang. That has everything to do with all that physics is. So, John, I counter with this. The tides go in. Tides go out. I do. You can't explain that. I can't explain that. But let me, let me quickly try to explain one or, one or two more things. Uh, one thing about the, the uh, everything goes, it becomes disorganized because of entropy. It, generally, in terms of energy, yes, it does lead to a disorganization or entropy. It doesn't mean that if intelligent uh, beings act on matter, they can't make it look more organized. They're not talking about all like the, the, the spines of your books all facing in one direction when they talk about organization. It has nothing to do with that. He has no idea what the second law of thermodynamics actually means or about how the Big Bang Theory actually happened. It has nothing to do with immediately everything was organized. No scientist has ever said that about the Big Bang Theory. And so if you're going to make a scientific case, which he's trying to make here, that the Big Bang Theory did not actually work, you should learn something about it before you do that. Yes, John, but I counter with... <laughs> so, okay, okay. I'm going to call that one even. We'll call it a tie. Comments go in, comments go out. You can't explain that. Okay. We've got one more. We now. do, though. Let, let's listen worse. to him on uh, the theory of evolution. I personally believe that this theory that Darwin came up with was something that was encouraged by the adversary. And it has become what is scientifically, politically correct. Amazingly, there are a significant number of scientists who do not believe it, but they're afraid to say anything. Okay, well, now we fully entered Cuckoo Land. <laughs> so it's amazing to me that, uh, let alone a Republican candidate for president, I guess we're kind of used to them being crazy, but a really successful neurosurgeon could believe those things and never pick a suit that fits. Those things <laughs> amaze me. <laughs> He has the most ill-fitting suits I've ever seen. Anyway, uh -huh. all right. The adversary messes with his closet. I think that's what's happening. No, no, but that you nailed it. That's my favorite part. The adversary. Oh, <laughs> God. The, come on, dude. Look, this guy, uh, he could be president of the United States of America. He's right now number two in the polls, mm -hmm. okay? In the Republican field, the Republicans uh, in any given election will at a bare, bare, bare minimum have a 40% chance of winning. Yeah. So there, but for the grace of entropy... 
goes, <laughs> the next president of the United States is the most powerful man on earth, and he thinks Satan put Charles Darwin up to it yeah. to come up with a theory that explains things really, really well on this planet to trick us. That's how tricky he is. Okay, and well, that's how the adversary works. The adversary. He's not one of those highfalutin priests who says Satan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The adversary. And also, of course, it had to be the adversary, because as we know, Gog and Magog were busy messing with the theory of gravity at the time. Yeah. Oh, it's no. insanity. He believes insane things. Why not just say a genie messed with it? Darwin was hounded by genies and afrites. Everybody knows it. Yeah. No, I, you can't. You can't put a guy. You can't make the most powerful man on Earth, the guy with the ability to press the button and, and nuke people, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, who thinks that the devil exists it, it, it literally in the world and goes and messes with people. What if he starts yeah. to think that the devil is messing with his vice president or with one of his adversaries, you know, whether it's Putin or the Grand Ayatollah or whoever, mm. and he's, oh, well, this is my chance to get the devil, right? What if he thinks the adversary starts messing with him? Like, once you start talking about that like, you're having conversations with God or the devil or whatever it is, yeah. Once Beelzebub has entered the room, logic has left the room. Yeah. And so, you can't, we can't have a president that's not attached to logic. I, I, I know, look, they, they, a lot of them would not have won a uh, logic contest. No. Okay. <laughs> a lot of them would not have done well. We more than zero points. Logical reasoning uh, part. But, but, this, puzzles are hard. but this is beyond the pale. Yeah. This is too much. It's insanity. And it, look, if you want to get into the idea that, as you said, that, that Satan is giving us scientific knowledge, which has t stood the test of time for hundreds of years and has provided a great deal of information uh, for us that has helped us uh, learn how to treat disease, understand the spread of species and all this. And then, like, it reveals the weakness of your God figure because Satan never actually wrote a book. The only book that was ever literally written by God, of well, the Ten of Commandments literally written, the others were dictated, was the Bible. The Bible has nothing about germs, provides no knowledge about that, which is why we had to go another 14, 1500 years to understand that. Uh, it has a terrible approximation for pi, which was worse than the Muslim world was coming up with at the same time. The scientific knowledge is so obviously flawed, even by the standards of a goat herd in the Middle East 2,000 plus years ago. But Satan is the distributor of accurate scientific knowledge. If that's the case, I'm with the Satanists. Well, that's, that's how Satan tricks you, John, by giving you accurate information. Yeah. Whereas God is far more clever than that. He will give you inaccurate information. Yes. Satan <laughs> gives you the ability to make a vaccine for HPV that, that stops some women from dying from cervical cancer. God is the one who tells you not to take it because it might turn you into a slut. And, and But by the way, that does go to some of their worldview. They are against, literally, humanists. Right? Yeah. And so... Bill O'Reilly talks about this all the time, the secular humanist he makes fun of, he degrades. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always been on the side of humans. <laughs> Call me crazy. But they're not. They're in the side of fairy tales, ironically, because he mentioned evolution yeah. being a fairy tale here, uh, and jinns and ghosts and ghouls and goblins and Beelzebubs. Oh, and, you know, they live in this complete fantasy. Well, you know why? They're children. Yeah. They never grew up. Right? I like novels with that stuff. I don't like White Houses with that stuff. Yeah, and, and so you've got these people who were told, and this, to be fair to them, they were brainwashed when they were kids, literally. Like, you know, eat with a fork and spoon, and but Jesus, 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 science sucks, science sucks. Don't ever listen to science. The only thing that's true is this thing that makes no fucking sense, this book, whatever, whichever book you're reading, right? Yeah. But when, it, when you grow up, it's time to put childish things aside. Yes. Okay, there are no ghouls and goblins. There's nobody whispering in Charles Darwin's ear. And as a neurosurgeon, you can't figure that out. Wow, that scares me. So I, I don't know what I'm more scared about. In fact, I want to ask you guys. I want to do a poll on the TYT app. Uh, are you more surprised that he has these beliefs because of how successful he was as a neurosurgeon or more surprised, <laughs> shocked and chagrined, uh, that we have a presidential candidate with these beliefs? I mean, I'm more surprised that we have a successful neurosurgeon. Yeah, with I think beliefs. I'd lean that way too. Yeah. I have higher standards for doctors. The presidents. And look, if your God can't even do as well as the Muslim God in figuring out pi, mm. come on. <laughs> Am I not the expert on pi? <laughs> that's saying, that's come from Johnny <laughs> Pie. So you know, oh no, what if the adversary tricked you into becoming Johnny Pie? <laughs>
that. So either way, how awesome is this? <laughs> I don't even know who made it. I think it was Tim. It's awesome. That is great. Okay, God help us all. If he exists. <laughs> uh, not, not God. The supporter. The su- anyway. <laughs> no, the, the proponent. <laughs> God. Uh, are we taking our first break? Yeah, sure. I mean, we already did the Pope and the devil, so we might as well take a break. <laughs> God knows what we'll come up with when we come back.
Alright, so let me read some tweets for you guys. Hashtag TYT Live is how you communicate with us during the show. Uh, citizen speak. Oh, I went there. Okay, uh, Big Ben Carson stumped on gravity and other science. Magnets, how do they work? <laughs> I lost it for a second there. Uh, the ending was really good, too. Okay. Okay, no, no, it's coming. Um, how do they work? Miracles. <laughs> Ken says, Ben Carson is why aliens won't talk to us. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's super funny. Max Richard says, Ben Carson always sounds slightly drunk to me. He sounds like a sleepy, slurring drunk. <laughs> I don't know if that's fair, but I kind of hear you. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Okay. Oh, well, that, when the adversary comes in, I'm going to kick your ass, adversary. You're not my own. <laughs> All right, I'm a Derby Panda says, how dare the Pope make sense? That's it, I'm studying the Church of Latter-day Reagans. <laughs> Very funny. And uh, Eric Johnson says, so the Pope thinks he can come in here and take away our Judeo-Christian values by spreading the word of Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, well, he won't have it. Eric won't That's have it. Good. Roar says, the Pope is nice, but he could have learned American before he arrived, surely. <laughs> and... <laughs> Ruth Iverson says, I need to go to TYT Anonymous. I run to my computer at this time like a crazy person. Oh my god, TYT's on. Oh my god, TYT's on. No, Ruth, that's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You crazy dog? In fact, expose that infection to as many people as you can. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, by the way, on the Ben Carson, I read an interesting headline. It might have been Daily Beast, it might have been something else. It was uh, Ben Carson successfully disproves idea that neurosurgeons are intelligent people. Yeah. No, no, it is. He me. might single-handedly destroy the reputation of brain surgeons. Yeah. Like, now all we'll have is rocket scientists. That'll be the only genius thing from now on. Yeah. Yeah. I have to look, it, but it, it, it literally has, because I started to think, like, maybe being a brain surgeon is not that big a deal. Maybe, maybe it really is all in the hands. They always talk about that. It, right, right. Like, they, okay, you learn. Obviously, you have to be smart enough to get through medical school, all that mm -hmm. stuff. And then, you know, and then you cut people's heads and all that. Like, whereas engineering, building things, you can't screw that up, that, and that's complicated, mm. right? At least it seems complicated to me, because, boy, I couldn't do it, right? Uh -huh. I don't build a bridge. Yeah. But look, we're having the conversation now, as to why, like, you, brain surgeons might not be that smart. Yeah. Because, single-handedly, because of Ben Carson. And the thing is, there's got to be at least one brain surgeon watching. I'm sure you're far smarter than us. We're not disputing that. We're just saying genius level? No. I think that the moderate brain surgeons should speak out against Ben Carson. Yeah, and I where are they? Where are their leaders? <laughs> okay, one last thing. I don't know why brain surgeons get like extra credit for working on the brain. You know that doesn't. You know that doesn't make them any smarter than a liver surgeon. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can live without a liver. <laughs> oh, wait, <laughs> that actually works. Out. Anyway, all right. Okay. We're okay. Forward. Let's uh, let's carry on. We hear a lot about religious freedom from conservatives these days, but when they use that term, what do they actually mean? Well, we've got a poll out of Iowa that's going to show what their definition of uh, religious freedom actually is and how self-serving it is in reality. Get this: only forty-nine percent of Iowa Republicans think the religion of Islam should even be legal in the United States, with thirty saying it shouldn't be, and twenty-one percent. Not sure. <laughs> Maybe the religion should be legal. Well, okay. Less than half say, yeah, they should be able to be a part of that religion if they want. John, I mean, to be fair, these are not the guys who say that they uh, believe in religious freedom, right? Like, they, they're not the ones who argue yeah. that uh, their religious beliefs should be sacrosanct. And sometimes even, sometimes even above the law. Exactly, yeah. Not, that's not this party, is it? I think, I'm going to do some more research. Pretty sure it's exactly the same. Oh, people. it's the same, same fucking people. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's right. crazy. I, I mean, like religious freedom, it can be stretched to all sorts of stuff these days. Like, I don't want to put my signature on a thing, even if you're paying me eighty thousand dollars a year to do so. Like, they'll try to stretch it. But if it means anything, anything at all, it should mean that you cannot be locked up simply for being a part of a religion. And they they have jumped way past everything else. They'll get rid of the Muslims eventually, but until then. They're definitely locking them up. And that's that's 51% either say it should be illegal or they're not sure. I don't even know what the fuck it means to not be sure about that. If, I, you may not be sure what the best flavor of Pop-Tart is. You should be sure whether or not it should be legal to practice a religion. Yeah. No, no. I mean, this is amazing. So you think they, they hate gays. Kim Davis won't have a marriage certificate. 
Muslims get married, who cares? Well, the conversation is whether it should be illegal or not. Yeah. That's crazy. From the party of religious freedom. So, but but look, we, we've known this for a long time. It's birds of a feather, man. They flock together. So yeah. these, are, these are the same fundamentalists. They're not any different than the uh, Muslim fundamentalists. Okay, everybody's heads explode. No, Muslims are worse! Okay, I know, I got it. So moving past and that. They're, they're all terrible. <laughs> okay, no, they're, they're Muslims, all Muslims. terrible. Okay. All right, moving past that rage. Uh, no, the idea is they think their religion should rule us all. Mm-hmm. And so that's the central, same central idea. So when you say to them, well, uh, okay, shouldn't you respect other religions? They think, no, of course I shouldn't. Of course I shouldn't. You should expect, uh, give me my freedom to dominate over you, right? Yeah. Well, if you're a gay person, I'm not going to let you have the same rights as me. And if and if you want me to, then you're taking away my freedom. Yeah. Other religions, if you pra- let you practice your religion, no, no, no. Yeah. My freedom as an American and a right winger Christian fundamentalist is yeah. to take away your freedom. Yeah, and, that's, and by the way, this is a long history in America. And again, it goes back to this great, great article I read in Alderman a long time ago about how, and it really changed my worldview on this because I couldn't believe it. But it, but it was a, a really compelling case about how the South, uh, during the Civil War, and they 100% genuinely, and after the Civil War too, believed that they had the freedom to enslave people. Yeah? And then when the North took that freedom away from them, they were genuinely outraged. That was intolerant of the North. That's right, because they were Northern agitators. Yeah. And they came and they were aggressors. And they came in and took away the freedoms that they'd always enjoyed. And so they can this- find a lot of support in the Bible for that. Now, there were, uh, abolitionists also found support for their side in the Bible, but the slave masters and people supporting slavery, they were too able to find things in the Bible that supported it. So, uh, so it's not, it shouldn't be that surprising to you that they think, like, yeah, of course, of course that's a, we, all other religions, we hate them. Yeah. <laughs> we hate them because we hate them. <laughs> so if we could, we'd make them illegal. That's so, it's, but it is, it's super sad that even in a country like America, where we are, where we have a great constitution, we're deeply secular, uh, arguably the first secular country uh, on the planet that said we will not have a religious test for office, we will not establish a religion in this country. We still have to fight that fight tooth and nail all the way through. So here, we're the guys who are saying, even though we're hardcore atheists, right, agnostic, atheists, whatever you want to call us. Atheists. (laughs) Atheists. Okay. Uh, that we're the ones fighting the fight to say, hey, wait a minute, those guys should have religious freedom. Yeah. Right? Religious freedoms for everybody. At the very least, not be locked up. <laughs> yeah, of course! Yeah. Right? And then eventually, hopefully, we can convince you to get rid of your religion. But until then, you should be free. Yeah, definitely. Yes. I mean, I'll talk your ear off about it, and I'll, and I'll hopefully I'll talk you out of it, but, yeah. uh, but, but in the meantime... Yeah, we're not going to lock you up. Yeah. Yeah, no, they fundamentally believe that rights only matter for groups that they are a part of. Except for gay rights, where even if they're a part of it, until they're publicly seen to be a part of it, they won't give you the rights. Oh, and by the way, if a Muslim country had come up with a poll that says, Oh my god, 30% of that country wants to make Christianity illegal and lock up all the Christians. Yeah. Oh my god, I knew it! I knew the Muslims! Yeah. The Muslims! Right? That's what you would hear. Now, look, it's not 30% of the U.S., to be fair. It's 30% of Republicans in Iowa. Yeah. But the Iowa polling, based on uh, public policy polling here, who did this poll, matches, uh, in other categories, matches the belief of Republicans in other states as well. So it's a fairly uh, representative poll in that sense. Yeah. One major party, you know, in a a Muslim country, if they said, let's just make Christianity illegal and arrest them all, that would be a giant, giant story. And we we saw something like that. They were trumping this poll that uh, it was, I think it was young Muslims in Britain at some point, some percent, fifteen percent, twenty five percent, said that infidels should be should be put to death. Uh, now, look, in this case, they said it should be illegal. We don't know exactly what the pe- penalty would be, and thankfully, in our country, Republicans don't support the death penalty. So it could certainly be that. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, it's only 30% plus the 21% who aren't sure. Now, amongst Trump voters, there's almost an even division. 38% think it should be allowed, 36% that it should not be allowed. So, uh, as always, the more uh, xenophobic, the more uh, anti Muslims uh, going with Trump there. Uh, and then, by the way, and this is certainly tied into this, and we're going to get into it with a story that Mike Huckabee a little bit later on. Uh, 69% of Iowa Republicans also believe that President Obama is waging a war on Christianity. That's definitely a safe belief to have about the, the head of our country. Waging a war. No, no, I, that's a, almost a more unbelievable. Because 
Look, I, I know that the fundamentalist Christians don't get the point of this country. I've known that for a long time. I get that they hate uh, Islam, and, yeah. and, you know, so I'm not surprised by Iowa Republicans at 30%. It's a hideous, horrible number, but I'm not surprised by it. But really, 69%, 7 out of 10 Republicans in Iowa think that Obama's waging a war against Christianity. I just, I, come on, man. That 7 out of 10 Republicans in Iowa, but probably again, the representative of the other states believes that it, they, they believe in things that are not remotely true. They believe in unbelievable fantasies. Yeah. They, they are living in an alternate reality. It's amazing. This is why it's so vital for the Republicans to convince them that he's not a Christian, because that then leads to this sort of thing. Well, if he's not that, he seems like Muslims. I guess he must be waging war. That, that's what they do that for. That's the big payoff for the investment of, uh, of racism and xenophobia that they've been doing. They live among um, us. And, and there's a lot of them, man. There's a lot of them, yeah. There's a lot of these, like, mental zombies walking around. Oh, Obama waging war against Christianity. Must stop him. That's pretty dangerous, man. Yeah. Yeah, finally, this sort of confirms other polls, uh, but... Uh, public policy polling found that Donald Trump uh, currently leads in Iowa with uh, 24%, uh, Ben Carson at 17%, Carly Fiorina in third with 13%. So uh, that has not shaken up too much in the past week or so. That's why when Ben Carson said, you know, I wouldn't let a Muslim be president, uh, now his campaign manager is tripling down. Carson came out, doubled down on it, wouldn't back away. Now his campaign manager is high-stepping and saying, mm -hmm. hey, I, we, I told you the Iowa voters agreed with us. Yeah. And he says, yeah. Iowa voters are saying, we're not going to vote for a Muslim either. Okay, so they're now proud of it. Wow. I'm telling you, the more you encourage this kind of discrimination and stereotypes, etc., the uglier it gets, and the more people feel emboldened to say, wait, I can say this in public? Yeah. I thought I only could say when I got drunk with my friends. Okay, now they said to encourage one another. It's a bad road to go down. Yeah. Okay, look, man, what's the real problem? Come on, people. Come on, come on. It's not, Christianity isn't the problem, of course not. No, Islam isn't the problem. I would say, of course not, other heads would explode over that. No, it's the fundamentalism, stupid! It's the fundamentalism that's a problem. The fundamentalist Christianity, fundamentalist Islam, and the fundamentalists of all the religions who are driving us to a bad, bad uh, place, man. Don't go there. Uh, Old Iowa. <laughs> Not sure Iowa was something. No, no, I was great. And by the way, Bernie Sanders is leading there. How bad could it be? Yeah, and Obama won Iowa back in 2008. And yeah. Iowa is a lot more progressive than you think it is. This is just the Republican yeah. side of Iowa. Exactly. And the, the particularly the, the primary voters, even crazier. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit of how we got there. Yep. Black Huckabee has gone full Trump on the issue of uh, Muslims and also the war on Christianity. So many Republicans believing it this, these days. Here is one of the reasons why. You're going to see in his recent comments about President Obama and Christianity. What do you prescribe for citizens to do? How should people begin to get involved so that um, we can fix this crisis of citizenship and bring back this balance between self-governance and government? Here's the point. There is no religious test to hold public office in America. I'm more concerned about the authenticity of their faith and how that plays out in their policies. I I'm also concerned about a guy that believes he's a Christian and pretends to be and then uh, and says he is, but then does things that uh, makes it very difficult for people to pa practice their Christian faith. I'm, I'm disappointed if a person says, I'm a Christian, but you invite to your home, and then you invite a whole bunch of people who are at odds with the Catholic Church uh, church policy. I think there's something uh, very un un unseemly about that. And it would seem that even the Vatican themselves are actually very concerned about whom the president has invited to meet the Pope. Yeah, I have actually not gotten that word at all. That's not in the news, um, that the Pope was concerned with who got invited to the White House. Yeah. There were activists, climate activists, LGBT activists, amongst others. Pope didn't seem to care. How can we mention the climate activists, too? But wait a minute, the climate activists agree with the Pope. The Pope agrees with them. So he's like, it's unseemly to invite people who are against the Christian Church. Well, are then the Pope is against the Christian Church. No, 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 they mean it's unseemly to, invent, to bring the Pope in. <laughs> He's against the Christian Church, <laughs> at least according to Mike Huckabee's interpretation of the Christian Church. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's crazy talk. He said he believes he's a Christian and then pretends to be a Christian. He refuses to just come out and say he's not a Christian. He's a Muslim. 
But that is exactly what he's saying. He is only pretending to be a Christian, uh, and then he's going to go on to, uh, he goes to extremes to accommodate Muslim terrorists, shows nothing but disdain for Christians, and his administration will go down as the most anti-Christian in American history. So why do 70% of Iowa Republicans believe there's a war in Christianity? Because every right-wing Christian leader is telling them that he is a Muslim plant, and he is trying to destroy your church. Okay. He, he, he's not sure that the guy's a Christian, and that uh, and that's why he's concerned about how he invited the Pope. Um, yeah, that's that's probably what a Muslim president would do. Invite the Pope mm-hmm. to the White House. <laughs> okay, he, he didn't think that one through completely, yeah. and, but he's like, it's some sort of trick, and it's a Muslim, and and, uh, he, and he's, of course, pissed at the Pope as well yeah. for believing in climate change and being more open to uh, homosexuals and not hating them entirely and not stripping away all their rights. And, and actually caring about the uh, uh, the needy, just like Jesus Christ would. But it, it's they're acting like they're they're mad that, at who he invited along with the Pope. But they're also mad at the Pope yeah. for his beliefs, and hence they're mad that Obama is featuring the Pope mm-hmm. in the White House and what they view to be his political beliefs. They love his political beliefs when they agreed with him, like so yeah. pro life. I mean, where'd you get that from, Mike Huckabee? Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so. But they're acting like he invited the Grand Ayatollah. Yeah. No, but he no, he invited the Pope, not the Grand Ayatollah. And if you hate him so much, why are you mad that Obama insulted him? You gotta choose one of those two. <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, now if you uh, we're gonna by the way in a second go back to video six. That was my bad before. Uh, if you have any uh, doubts about the compatibility of a Christian theocratic presidential candidate like Huckabee. Uh, getting into office, uh, let's find out what Huckabee thinks about democracy and the value of your vote in this video. What do you prescribe for citizens to do? How should people begin to get involved so that um, we can fix this crisis of citizenship and bring back this balance between self-governance and government? Don, I know that most politicians say we want everyone to vote. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't. I don't want everyone to vote. <laughs> if they're so Unless stupid, they're voting the right way. Well, that's well. right. If they're going to vote for me, then they need to vote. If they're not going to vote for me, they need to stay home. I mean, it's that simple. But in the big picture, there are people who vote and they have no idea what, what our Constitution says. Like uh, our Constitution that's in favor of democracy <laughs> and thinks everybody should get to vote. Yeah. And I thought he, when I read it, I thought he was joking. But when you hear him, he doesn't seem like he's joking no. that much. I mean, now that people laugh this He may like, be joking, but he's not really joking. Yeah. Um, and I love the idea of this guy calling other people stupid. That's uh, hilarious. Uh, now, he went on to talk in that uh, interview about how the federal government wants to, quote, dissolve the republic. It sounds like you want to dissolve the republic because <laughs> you're not that in favor of democracy. Anyway, he says, by placing the states under remote control. Okay. So, it, again, triggered for me. Why do they care so... And I... And it's funny that I have to remind myself every once in a while of this, right? Why do they care so much about states' rights? So that seems like a, why is that a conservative issue versus a liberal issue? What, I mean, in, in terms of like, because some states want to restrict gay marriage. So, okay, I get it why conservatives would be in favor of that. But some states want to legalize marijuana, and the conservatives hate that. Yeah. Some states want to uh, legalize assisted suicide. Conservatives hate that. So why do they care so much about it? And they get everybody riled up their base, too. They're like, states' rights! It seems like such a peculiar, like, legalistic thing to get worked mm-hmm. up about, right? And then I, and everyone said that I remember. Right. The original states' rights issue. Yeah. Slavery. Right? So all Jim of this... Crow and desegregation. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So it's not to say that the people who care about states' rights now want to go back to slavery. That's not what I'm saying. But the reason they cared about states' rights in the first place and what that triggers for them, it, it, it triggers for them, yes! Remember when they took our rights away by taking our slaves? So, like, don't, don't take my rights yeah. away! I get to dominate! In my state, I get to dominate over other people. Yeah. I've been doing it for hundreds of years, and these sons of bitches are going to come in here with their highfalutin federal government, right? Yeah. And take away my rights to hate on blacks, gays, or whoever I'm hating on today. Well, I got states' rights! Right? That's what states' rights means. That's what Huckabee's talking about. And, and I would say, finally, that that's to the extent that they ever genuinely cared about states' rights. They do definitely care about it on those particular issues, but as a, a general orientation towards politics, I don't think that they ever cared any more than liberals do. 
I think that when they had the chance to pass a federal bill that would affect all states that supported a policy that they approve of, in the case of DOMA or, you know, a federal ban on abortion, those sorts of things, they're not going to stop and say, well, is this consistent with our political philosophy? No, I don't think that they ever genuinely cared about it, except when it came to slavery. Yep. All right. Uh, we got uh, time for one last story. Um, hop the pond. Uh, yeah, yes. Indeed, let's hop the pond. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the UK to the extent that I can. The election of Jeremy Corbyn to be the head of the UK's uh, Labour Party is already paying off, at the very least, for that party, with their membership roles soaring to at least recent historical highs. Uh, now, his success in the near future in terms of being able to get his policies uh, put into uh, practice is still a little bit up for debate, and he is a controversial figure, which we're going to talk about a little bit in this clip, but the numbers certainly are good, at least over the past few weeks. The latest numbers released by Labour show that 62,000 people have joined it in the week since Saturday, 12th of September. This compares to less than 62,000 people who were members of the Liberal Democrats, according to figures last released in June. Total party membership is now around 380,000, so that's a significant portion of that, actually. The figure is approaching the 400,000 figure recorded at the 1997 election, although in previous decades, uh, quite a bit ago, they had had close to a million members. So it's still not at historic highs, necessarily. So even if you're not from uh, Great Britain and you don't know the, about the Liberal Democrats, a lot of people know the Green Party. And so you would think if you're very liberal, you might be in favor of the Green Party, but they have 67,000 members, oh. which again is very similar to the number that signed up for the Labor Party just and after Corbyn got elected. Weeks, yeah. Right. So uh, to be the leader of Labor. Now, of course, later, Labor is a much larger party historically in the UK, oh. and so you have to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, exactly. Well, but, but there's no... The overall the theme here is indisputable, which is this is a trend. I mean, this is a trend worldwide, whether it's the Greeks, it's here, Bernie Sanders popularity here in the U.S., it's Jeremy Canada. Corbyn, it's Canada. In Alberta, liberals winning in Alberta. For those of you who are not familiar with Canadian, uh, Canadian. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, politics of Canada, uh, that's amazing. It's unprecedented, right? The left is surging. There's a very good reason why. Yeah. Now let's tell you about who Corbyn is, if you're not familiar with him, and then we'll explain how he fits into this puzzle. Yeah, right. really fast. Just uh, they, they, this seems to be a clear trend. One person isn't buying it. You might remember the same. This is Tony Blair. If Jeremy Corbyn becomes leader, this is written right before the election, it won't be a defeat like 1983 or 2015 at the next <laughs> election. It will mean rout, possibly annihilation. Well, now we're going to look at some of his policy positions, and maybe we can decide if they're going to literally be annihilated. Well, of course, if you know some of those positions, you know that uh, what Tony Blair is actually worried about is his own annihilation, because Corbyn believes that he should be arrested for war crimes. Yeah. <laughs> so Tony Blair is like, I, mean, I, do, I, do, I, do, I do declare, is that not a very good idea to put Corbyn in charge? <laughs> yeah, because you're looking at a jail cell, so could you up? Could you up? Shaney would be like, what? That can't be, that can't be right. <laughs> he may not uh, visit London anytime soon. Well, but again, this is why people are, are tired of the Obamas and the Hillary Clintons and the Tony Blairs and all these lukewarm uh, progressives that aren't really progressive. They, they, they hijack the, the progressive parties in their respective countries and turn them into another way of serving the corporate interests, yeah. right? And people are, being t are tired of being crushed by that corporate machine. Yeah. So now let's go to Corbyn's policy so you get yeah. a sense of what they actually are interested in. Yeah, so we've got policies in a number of different categories. And understand, obviously, very different political contexts over in the UK. I think some of these we're probably going to like, but there are some in this list that I don't, I don't expect Cenk will actually approve of. Let's see. Mm, Corbyn's policy platform includes renationalizing Britain's railroad system and energy companies, abolishing tuition for British universities, and imposing rent controls to deal with Britain's affordable housing problem. So some of those sound like you might hear uh, Bernie Sanders uh, talking about in this country. Uh, he, but that's definitely to the left of Bernie Sanders. A little bit. I mean, he's talked about making the, the free uh, public uh, college tuition. Uh, that is something. I don't know, but he hasn't talked about rent controls necessarily, but I could yeah. use it. And you're right. Look, I, I think the surge of the left throughout the world is a great thing overall. But it, it is a balancing measure. Am I that far left? No, I'm not. I'm just not, right? So it would be uh, free universities. That idea I love. And so maybe I'm biased here because my dad got a free education. Otherwise, I'd be an olive farmer in southeastern Turkey, right? So 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Turkish version of. Okay. Uh, so free education makes all the difference. It's opportunity, etc. Uh, rent control. Ugh, that hasn't worked out that well. It's got a bad history and. It's true, but we we got some fucking problems in America in terms of rent. I, I, I know the rent is too damn high. It is too damn high, and it's but, it's unlikely to go down in the future. I know, but price controls have never worked. It's a terrible idea, if you ask me. But I'm when it comes to economics, I'm I'm much more centrist, even maybe center right. So as much as I like Corbett, I don't agree with that. Would I vote for him? Yeah. Give you show me the alternatives. Given the alternatives, certainly and. The central component, which we haven't gotten to. Yeah. Uh, he's open to reopening the coal mines that used to be a big part of Britain's economy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I don't know too much about Britain's capacity for alternative energy sources at this point in terms of being able to power their entire uh, nation's grid. Uh, doesn't I wouldn't want them to go back in the direction of coal, though. That doesn't seem like a good thing. So I think what he's doing there is, A, he's being populist. B, he's saying, I'm going to bring you your jobs. Yeah, I get, I get that. But see, more importantly than that, he's actually using an old right-wing trick from here in America, which is, I'm going to bring you back to the good old days. Mm -hmm. Remember when uh, Britain was doing well, and you remember your childhood when we had the coal mines? Yeah, I know we had issues, but yeah. you loved your childhood, didn't you? I'm going to bring you back to that time. Yeah. We're going to colonize very, India next week. Yeah, it's a very clever, that's funny, we're a very clever political strategy. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay, he wants to, uh, I think you're going to like some of these, he wants to end Britain's austerity spending cuts, he also proposes something called People's Quantitative Easing, in which the Bank of England would print money to invest in infrastructure projects. Now, if, I, if they didn't do quantitative easing in other ways, I'd say, whoa, whoa, whoa don't be crazy, don't print money, mm -hmm. I mean, that's going to lead to inflation, etc., to pay for, uh, no, no, I would never want to be, except for the fact that they do do quantitative easing already, and instead of paying for things that the people need and the public need, they just give it to the bankers yeah. at nearly 0% interest rate. Yeah. Well, that's a goddamn crime. Right? I prefer their version to ours in that respect. Yeah, I mean, so you want to do people's quantitative easing is better than the quantitative, quantitative easing we have now. So, look, I know that the, uh, what the Fed does and, and what he wants to do here, it's it's a little more complicated than the simplistic way we've broken it down here. And I know yeah, the totally. point is to for the banks to go out there and, and get, lend the money to other people and stimulate the economy. I understand all that. But nonetheless, they get trillions of dollars at nearly 0% interest rate. You give me trillions, billions, millions at 0% interest rate, I can make a lot of money too. That's true. <laughs> yeah. I, someday those banks are going to lend that money out. Okay, uh, now let's turn to foreign policy. He wants to withdraw from NATO and abolish the UK's nuclear arsenal and has suggested that Blair could face a war crimes trial for his role in the Iraq War. He's looking backwards. Uh, he's written that Russian expansionism is not unprovoked, and that the obsession with Cold War politics that exercises the NATO and EU leaderships is fueling the crisis. He has also in the past, in at least one speech, referred to both uh, Hamas and Hezbollah as friends of Britain. So that I dismiss entirely. The reason is, he's like, uh, we should invite our friends in Hezbollah and our friends in Hamas it's, it was a matter of speaking, yes. and, and he says, now look, of course I didn't mean they're my friends, right? I meant we should negotiate with the other side. They're the other yeah. side, so we should negotiate. I agree with that. Agreed. Now, uh, on the Russia story, you know, I think he's being a little naive about uh, Russia, but you want to negotiate with Russia? I'm all for that. I believe in negotiation. I don't think you should go blitzkrieging into eastern Ukraine to show Putin who's boss, right? Uh, do I believe in getting rid of the nuclear arsenal? No, I don't. Okay, so that makes me a bad lip, uh, but if I was Great Britain, I wouldn't do that. Um, on the other hand, should people who invaded Iraq or uh, Iraq under false pretenses and then committed war crimes be held accountable? Yeah, that's what war crimes are about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and if you're going to go after the lowly soldiers who did it or the, you know, and, uh -huh. and at Abu Ghraib, we put away some people for torture, but we have the memos that go all the way up to the top that yeah. says, take your gloves off, and start doing these kind of practices. Yeah. So why did we never prosecute those guys? And you know, fair. if you were to lock up a few of the people who obviously lied in multiple countries into going to war, maybe in the future, future politicians would think twice before lying to us about something as significant as a more than a decade-long multi-trillion dollar series of wars throughout the Middle East. So I totally agree with that. I definitely would not withdraw from NATO. No. Uh, so there's a lot I disagree with Corbin on, but overall, given the status quo, would I rather keep voting for an establishment candidate that's going to keep on doing the same things that they've been doing or someone who's going to shake the system up 
I'm going to vote for shaking it up. Yeah, now, again, it remains to be seen how successful he will be in taking his coalition together and actually getting his legisl legislative goals uh, accomplished. I've been looking over some of the recent polling, and generally, when a new leader is elected to a party, there tends to be this significant bump in the same way that our presidential elections have it. Uh, his was minor, if not non-existent, which generally is not the case. And his popularity on a number of different issues is very low. Now, he's obviously popular enough that his party did quite well, and he did quite well. Um, but there are some issues, especially the economic policies, which I would have imagined Britain would be a fan of this, considering the, the, the damage that austerity has done to Britain, at least from our perspective. But he doesn't seem to be very popular on those issues, not, not at present. All right, so he, let me say two things about that. First of all, the, the central theme is he's against austerity. And, and a lot of parts of Europe, including the UK, are sick of austerity, right? So that, that message will resonate. That's why he's popular. It's not like people have voted for him, even within the Labour Party, like, oh, can't wait to get out of NATO. Yeah, I'm going to go with, with this guy, right? Yeah. Or I clearly agree with his views on Hezbollah or whatever it is, right? No, no, they hate austerity. That's why they voted for him. Yeah. That's the central thesis. And you were right about that central thesis. So uh, now, a couple months ago, this, does he have a chance? That's a big question. A couple months ago, the odds makers, according to at least Vox, in the article that I read, would have put Corbyn at 100 to 1 to win the leadership of Labour. Wow. Well, they would have lost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And so can he win uh, overall? Well, I think the answer is yes. I'm not saying he will win overall. I'm saying he certainly can win, and they are grossly underestimating. Okay, number one, they're underestimating people's, um, you know, how they're repulsed uh, by the establishment. That's true here in the U.S., it's true in the U.K., and the establishment keeps underestimating, yeah. right? Uh, n number two, he's running a super populist campaign, which is very smart. So that coal mines thing, it seems like a weird throwback to yeah. us, but I actually think that it's a really smart politics in a way that's subconscious in a sense. And he's coming out strong. People love strong politicians. They're used to associating the left with weakness, right? It drives us crazy uh, that that's the association, but that's what the propaganda has been uh, in, in both sides of the Atlantic. And he's saying, well, yeah, you want to see strong? I'll show you strong, right? And that resonates. Yeah. And so... Combine that with the fact that the UK is sick of austerity, he is, they like his central idea, and he's doing all these other things right, I mean, if you're discounting him, I think you're making a terrible mistake, yeah. right? And, and maybe I hope you continue to make that mistake so he can win, <laughs> and we can get different leadership, uh, even if I don't agree with uh, some of what he says. All right, God bless. That's the state of the UK. Here comes the left! Out of nowhere! <laughs> Overall, in the whole world, man, left hook. <laughs> All right. Boxing him. No, no, no. left hook. Okay, uh, we will discuss the left more in the second hour because apparently that's where Satan resides. And no, I don't mean the political left. I mean the literal left. Okay? Wait till you get to that story. Uh, Johnny Pie, uh, check him out every day on youtube.com slash think tank. You know, some people, I saw a tweet, they literally think your name is Johnny Pie. <laughs> I love that misimpression. Uh, anyway, try to the work of the adversary, I think. <laughs> yeah, and in your case, the adversary for you was originally Ben Banquet, yeah. and then Jimmy Dore. And it's just spiraled from there. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you in a bit.
and they need a good scare. Uh, but more important than a scare, they need change. Okay, uh, member shout out Xavier Griffin is member number 1249, and Julia Lower is member number 2454. Donor Wall shout outs people who built the store, studio Zachary Zilawi. Zachary, you know who you are, man. Uh, you know you got a challenging name like me. But uh, I appreciate that you uh, put in money here. Really, really appreciate it. And Jared J. Drucker. Okay? Thank you, guys. Casper, go! All right, let's do it. Martin Screlly of Turing Pharmaceuticals has agreed to lower the price of Daraprim, a drug that his small pharmaceutical company purchased for $55 million and then raised the price from $13.50 a pill to $750 per pill. Now, of course, he's gotten a lot of negative attention for this, and when he tried to explain himself, it only led to more negative attention because his reasoning behind increasing the drug's price made absolutely no sense whatsoever. He says that we need newer drugs to treat something known as toxoplasmosis, and it turns out that we don't necessarily need that, and also you shouldn't be taxing patients for new and upcoming drugs. Now, Martin Screlly did not say what the new price would be, but expected a determination to be made over the next few weeks. He also says of the reaction that he's been getting, yes, it is absolutely a reaction. There were mistakes made with respect to helping people understand why we took this action. I think that it makes sense to lower the price in response to the anger that was felt by people. Now, I find it interesting that he won't admit or or even tell us what he would lower the price to. He's like, oh, we're going to lower it enough so we either break even or make a little bit of a profit. Except I don't think he's going to lower the price at all. I think he's hoping that we're going to ignore him or forget about him in the next few weeks, and then he'll continue selling this drug for an insane amount of money. So uh, I think this guy is monumentally full of shit. And so let me break it down for you, though, uh, in, in terms of exactly what I mean by that. Uh, will he lower the price? Well, I'm sure he will to some degree, but to what? I mean, it used to be thirteen dollars and fifty cents. So is he going to lower it to fifteen dollars from seven hundred and fifty that he'd raise it to? Of course not, right? So is he going to lower it to six hundred and fifty dollars? Well, that would continue to be a crime. Right? That's an unbelievable difference between thirteen fifty and seven fifty. So, yeah, he could technically lower it, but it doesn't matter. He's going to make money hand over fist. That's the whole point of this. And then he says, well, look, you got to understand, we spent a lot of money on research, blah, 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 blah. Uh, no. You didn't spend money no. on anything other than buying the drug. You bought the drug. You didn't spend any money on research. <laughs> you didn't build that, right? He claims he's going to build the next drug. Yeah, I'll believe that when I see it, right? There's no evidence that he's spending any money in that direction. And so, and then when they ask him about this, he says, quote, it's very hard stuff to understand. He's so sophisticated and so intelligent and intellectual, and unfortunately, we just can't understand all the hardships that he's going through right now with buying this drug and selling it for, what is it, I think 5,000 times the original price? Yeah. So, it's an old Wall Street and corporate trick to say, oh, no, these derivatives, they're so complicated. What the Federal Reserve is, it's so complicated. It's, so, it's hard for you to understand. You plebeians, you have simple minds. Just leave the hard stuff to us, okay? There's a very good reason why I had to rob you blind. It's very complicated to explain to you, though, right? And uh, and in case you're wondering, wait, is that true? I mean, is it hard to understand? Uh, what do other people in the field think? Well, the Infectious Disease Society of America and the HIV Medicine Association all find their cause completely, quote, unjustifiable, right? So, no, of course it's not. Now, in all those costs that he talks about and how, oh, my God, I don't know if I'm going to break even, the one cost that he doesn't mention is financing costs. Okay, now, why is that? Because what happens is, this is a trick that he's done before, and some others have done before. You buy a, a, a piece of medicine that is very much needed. You can't go without it, right? If you have an infectious disease like this, if you don't have this, it'll, it could kill you, right? And so you buy it, and there's no competitor. And then you jack up the price. Since now the industry is aware of that practice, mm -hmm. there becomes a little bit of a bidding war. Okay? And so the price gets bid up. And once you bid up the price and you already paid all that money, well, there's financing costs that goes along with that purchase. So he's got to make the financing cost up, and he already built that into the price. So several different people got rich off of this already, right. including the people who sold it. So, now, he can't tell you most of the money is going towards financing because it sounds like 
uh, financial tricks, which is exactly what it is, right? And so that's why he's got to say, oh, yeah, um, other medicines and research costs, and, where, and he's not telling you his main costs. Right. Right? So that's why he cranked it up to $750, so he could pay off the financing on a purchase he probably paid too much for because he knew he was going to do this trick, right, and still make a gargantuan profit. We live in a sick society, and one of the biggest mistakes you can make in America is getting sick or getting injured because there are people out there preying on you, waiting for that situation so they can take advantage of you. Like you said yesterday, Jake, what happens to people who have this condition and they can't afford this price? And you don't have insurance. And, and by the way, one of the reasons that people, I don't know this, and I haven't read in anything, I, this part is speculation, but, you know, as usual, uh, there's, it's grounded in facts and, and, and other contexts that I've read. I'd be surprised if this guy, if this guy didn't get thrown under the bus, uh, and where a place he richly deserves, by the way, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the insurance companies are like, wait, I'm going to pay this bill, right, for most people. Okay, so you're going to fuck with me, and you're going to charge me this money? That's a good point. Okay. Hey, little 32-year-old punk who's not backed by any other giant corporate uh, uh, entity. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you don't know who you fucked with, right? So if, I would be shocked if the insurance companies didn't have a role to play in this guy being sp spotlight being on this guy. Okay. Yeah. Secondly, Hillary Clinton sent out a tweet about this. Again, this guy's got no backup. No, you know, you don't have to feel sorry for him because he appears to be a dirtbag, right? But it's easy to throw a guy with no backup under the bus, right? There's no giant entity that's going to come in and fight back against you. Yeah. So it's an easy target for a politician to pick where they seem like a tough guy. They seem like they're doing the right thing. They seem like they're progressives, and they pick an easy target. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to be a progressive and you're going to go after the insurance company, so oh, 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 you're going to have a different fight on your hands. Then they're going to fight back. You're going to have negative ads. You're going to have contributions to your opponents, mm -hmm. etc. So that is the the background for this very interesting story. All of a sudden, being in the news. So I think that's a pretty good educated guess. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about Dieselgate. Volkswagen is in a world of trouble after the Environmental Protection Agency discovered that they were using tricks in order to pass certain emissions tests. Now, uh, the cars in question here are specifically diesel cars, which is why this whole scandal is referred to as Dieselgate. Now, to give you some more information, on Friday, the EPA said Volkswagen found a way to circumvent emissions requirements during testing with a de defeat device that lets the TDI cars detect when they are being tested, and then they emit far less than normal. Okay, mm -hmm. So... Basically, these cars are just driving around town and they're emitting all of these uh, pollutants, specifically something known as nitrogen oxide. And as soon as they're being tested, there's this device that basically makes them emit less. Let me give you more information. When the device is not working, the cars are operating in regular driving and oper operating on regular driving, they emit 10 to 40 times more than the allowable legal levels of certain pollutants. Compared with other run-ins between the EPA and automakers, Volkswagen's alleged violation stands out in its brazenness. So the incredible thing about this story is the way they got outed. Okay, So there was um, a small organization in Germany, and they were trying to prove that these diesel cars are actually very fuel efficient, and they might be a good model in terms of protecting the environment and also saving energy, saving gas. And they wanted to test out these Volkswagen vehicles themselves to make that point. And in the process of doing that, they found all these inconsistencies. They had absolutely no desire to out them. They actually wanted to defend Volkswagen and all these diesel vehicles. And it turns out that, you know, they were out and we found out that they were totally cheating the system. Now, I want to tell you which cars are in question here. They're cars from 2009 and 2015 and includes the TDI Volkswagen Golf, Jetta, Beetle, Audi uh, A3S, and also the Passat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so super interesting story in a couple of different ways. First of all, I'm shocked that it's not about uh, Shaq. Uh, I thought for sure Dieselgate was about that. Um, okay, <laughs> second of we all. We wouldn't be covering it. <laughs> okay, no, seriously, um, 
on the one hand, the apology of Volkswagen and their efforts to try to make this right uh, are significant. Okay, so the use apologies. The CEO is like, I had nothing to do with it, but I immediately fire myself. Yeah, the, right. the CEO has decided to resign, and he's like, I have no idea. I had no idea this was going on. And look, I'm used to typical American CEOs that lie to us constantly, but the executive board has released a list of what they intend to do to make things right. And throughout that list, they say, look, the CEO had no idea. He's been an incredible CEO, but we respect his resignation. We're going to go ahead and let him go. So again, if it was a U.S. company, I'd be enormously skeptical, but a U.S. company would not have dealt with it this way, right? Also in that statement, the board explained that we are going to do our damnedest to find out who uh, made these decisions, and then we're going to help uh, prosecute them criminally. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now, here's how a U.S. bank, for example, would have dealt with it. No, CEO is fine. What are you talking about? No, no, you guys, it's very complicated. You don't understand. Okay? It's your it's your fault for being so stupid that you don't understand that we had to do this, and if you arrest anyone, it will endanger the global economy. How dare you? How dare you? Take it back. Well, okay, fine. I'll negotiate with you. I'll give you back 10% of what I made from this. Okay, that's it. That's my final offer. They never fired their CEO. They wouldn't let the CEO resign. None of the CEOs resigned when we had a global economic catastrophe caused by U.S. bank companies and on, on other bank companies as well. And uh, nobody went to jail, etc. So Volkswagen reaction to it is refreshing in that it appears, and you don't know yet, the proofs on the pudding, they haven't acted yet, except for the CEO resigning. It appears that they're going to very aggressively work with the government to root out what happened here. On the other hand, this is not a mistake. Okay, you don't, it's a piece of software that they program. Mm -hmm. So you can't accidentally program a piece of software to do exactly what you want it to do, which is a defeat in environmental regulations. Whoever did it clearly did it on purpose. Yeah. And it's not like some computer programmer can be like, oh, let me sneak this into the code. Oh, look, if you, you know, do this and this on a video game, it turns out you can see her tits. Right? Like that happens from time to time, right? In goofy stories. No. <laughs> I've never heard that story, but okay. Yeah, yeah, it's an Easter egg thing or whatever it is, right? Okay. Uh, on Rand Paul's app, you can play Space Invaders if you hit enough right buttons, okay? Okay. So, but this is a car, and in order to have that software and then put it into the car and have everybody agree to put it in the car, it's going to require a lot of people. A lot of people to say, to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're too terrific on, uh, you know, on the environment and the, the regulations, etc. And they ran a ton of ads about it. And go ahead and put that thing in there, right? Yeah, and remember, one of their advertisement ideas was to really emphasize the fact that these diesel vehicles are fuel efficient and environmentally friendly, right? So a lot of people out there bought the, these cars for those reasons. And so they were sold a lie, okay? They're actually driving these cars that are polluting, polluting the environment considerably. And also, another thing is, look, they probably did this because they want to have fast cars with torque, right? Impressive torque. But at the same time, probably save some money. But they didn't save money. This is actually going to cost them quite a bit. So first, let me tell you what cars did in order to be more fuel efficient and in order to make sure that they don't put out as many pollutants, okay? So in order to meet the tougher emissions regulations that went into effect in 2008, most automakers started supplying their diesel cars with tanks of a urea-based solution, often referred to as AdBlue, that cuts down on nitrogen oxide emissions. Now, I'm sure that costs money, and maybe the person who's behind all this thought, well, maybe we can, you know, do something where we can avoid that, make it seem as though our cars are not polluting the environment, and we can still uh, avoid compromising the, the performance of the car, right? But now they're going to have to pay a lot of money in recalling these cars, changing the technology in them, a maximum possible fine of $37,500 per vehicle, which could add up to as much as $18 billion for Volkswagen and Audi. That's insane. Well, they, they won't wind up paying that because it's the U.S. Uh, so I don't know how much uh, they lobby already. Um, but if they didn't lobby before, they're going to have to learn how to lobby now. <laughs> I'm sure they had some presence, but we know this from experience because BP, uh, now which also was not a U.S. company, uh, once they uh, had the disaster in the Gulf, they kicked their lobbying up into overdrive, spent 
so much money, and they spent hundreds of millions of dollars to avoid billions of dollars in fines, and now we're finding out that, of course, they're not going to pay what they said they were going to pay, and a lot of that was tricks. So right now, it looks like an $18 billion fine, but after Volkswagen spends hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying, that'll get knocked down by billions and billions and billions, is my guess if history is any guide in the U.S. Now, nonetheless, I, I, you know, I'm open to seeing how they handle this. Maybe since they are a German company, they will handle it differently. And by the way, there's real reason for that. In Germany, half of the board of a company is made up by labor because they want to make sure that they protect the company and they protect their jobs. So now, uh, here in America, that uh, that would be met with charges of socialism. Yeah, that would people's, never happen. Here. People's heads exploding, Koch brothers defeating every candidate they, they, that ever suggested that. But, it's, and that's how that will never work, except Germany has an excellent economy. And it has worked. It's worked really well. So it is possible that Volkswagen will not spend a gargantuan amount of money lobbying. They will not fight the government tooth and nail, as U.S. companies do. But they'll, in fact, find out who were the number of people responsible and Give me a dance, goddammit! And, and then uh, and turn a new leaf and actually pay what they owe. You know, corporations don't normally do that, but then German corporations are a little different than U.S. corporations because of how they're structured. So it'll be a really interesting test case to see how they react. Yeah. There are more like conventional ways to pour a drink. Right? Mm -hmm. So I guess we will see how it works out. It's just but incredible. To the 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 system to get to the end. And I, I like that this person is likely to get caught, and I'm super happy that they're going to try to prosecute him criminally. That's the best part about it. Yeah. But I mean, look, think about it, too, because that means they put so much pollutants into the air. So that affects some people directly. If you have asthma, you have certain conditions, it could even endanger your life, depending on you know, the your levels. Your respiratory uh, conditions, yeah. Yeah, the levels of toxins in the air and uh, your particular conditions, right? But in the long run, even if it doesn't affect you on a micro level like that, on a macro scale... It affects us all, especially if you've got kids, they're more susceptible to it, etc. And it harms all of our health. And it goes back to the idea we've been talking about, which is uh, you privatize the gains, Volkswagen makes the money, puts it in their pocket. If they never got caught, well, they just socialize uh, the losses, right? So all the health uh, costs that would come out of that, well, we're going to have to bear that as a society. They get to keep the profits, and they put all the costs onto us, right? So it's a minor miracle we caught them. Okay, because of this strange set of events that Anna explained to you. And now, by the way, we'll also get to test the Justice Department here in the U.S. They said they were going to go after white-collar criminals with much more fervor. Okay, here's their first opportunity. And for them, it's actually kind of a layup. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. If it was a really powerful bank or a really powerful corporation that does a ton of lobbying here in America, then I'd be really surprised. Yeah. In this case, more of an open question yeah, this will be a test not just for Volkswagen, but also for our Justice Department. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to tell you what people have died from more than shark attacks in America. No.
people are dancing in the control room, not JR. Um, what? <laughs> I'm saying people are dancing, but not JR. But he does look good in those monster headphones, I'll tell you that right now. He's a Lord Mercy. Great sound system in the in, here in the studio, and the monster headphones rocking it out in the control room where you need to hear perfectly. I just noticed JR's awesome shirt. California represent. Let me see. I have so much California pride, it's disgusting. I don't even understand the diamond. Why the diamond? Because we're the best. <laughs> JR's got a lot of bling today with the golden <laughs> headphones and the di t shirt. <gasps> okay. I know, I know. Uh, it started from the bottom, so you got to wear your diamonds and monster headphones all around the house. Um, okay, Andrew writes in uh, on hashtag TYT Live. In regards to the CEO quitting, you might say he fell off the wagon. I like that. I like that. <laughs> ah, that's a guy after my own heart. Yeah. The Volkswagen. Uh, Al Belso says, if there's one thing I appreciate every day about being born in Canada, it's our health care. Well, we don't blame you, Al. That makes sense. Really? Conservatives in America say that you guys are miserable with your long oh, waits and all sure. that. Uh, Hopkirk says, um, Daraprim costs $1 per tablet in the UK and other countries. $13 was already price gouging before before the 5,000% increase. Uh, yeah. That's exactly right. For the same reasons that I explained before. You know what, what else is awesome about other countries? That you can walk into a pharmacy, tell the pharmacist what's ailing you, and then you just get the drug you need. Mm -hmm. That's. I wish we could do that. Right? If people want to abuse drugs, let them abuse drugs. It's not my problem. Man. I Seriously. I'm not abusing. I hate that you have to go to, like, you're a primary care physician, you're like, oh my god, my leg hurts, and then you go to a leg doctor, and then the leg doctor tells you, oh, you know what, you gotta go to the art doctor instead. Whatever, it's annoying. Yeah, one last thing on that, you know, we just, a uh, family member just came out of the hospital, and they're like, the doctor told them to go get something, but they had to go to their primary care physician first to get it. And the primary care physician's like, I don't know, the specialist already told you what to get, what do I know? Oh, Alright, so go back to the specialist. Like, oh! Okay. Anyway, uh, now, Jeremy Varner writes in, I've never seen someone look uh, so smug in every single photo they've ever taken. Martin Shkreli. Shkreli. How shines even Trump in that regard? Jeremy, I agree with you, man. That guy, <laughs> every picture's like this. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, Bitchy Gay Guy says, this Martin Shkreli guy is such an asshole, he might... Turn me away from assholes forever. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I like that okay. joke. Little do you know about March God. Anyway. Okay, okay uh, by the way, uh, I didn't mention in my incredibly long rant about Dieselgate uh, that part of the reason we had the problem in the first place is because the U.S. allows the car companies to self certify their cars. Preposterous. So, yeah. Oh, what do you think? Is your product good? Oh, dude, it's great. Yeah, you, you, know, you wouldn't believe how good it is. <laughs> All right, boom, self-certified. In fact, we're the best self-certified talk show in the business. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, boom. All right. New evidence shows that narcissism can kill you, and it's more likely to kill you than a shark attack. According to uh, new research, 12 people have died in the last year from taking selfies. Only 8 people have died from a shark attack. <laughs> so everybody knows that shark attacks are overhyped, right? Like, oh my god, shark week, right? Um, and, and so we, we're not surprised by that side of the equation. But the selfie thing, you're like, wait, how do they die from the selfies, right? Like, I know it's self-indulgent and it's annoying to many other people, but how do they die? That's the interesting part. Yeah. yeah, so they die from taking selfies in very dangerous places, right? So there was a recent case involving someone who was taking a picture at the Taj Mahal in India, and it was a 66-year-old man, so it's not all teenagers and millennials who are doing this. They're older people as well who want to take a picture at, you know, a landmark or something, but they do so in a dangerous angle, maybe by some stairs, and then they fall and then they die. D-I-E, die. Now, this is a tragic story. I feel terrible for this guy, but he's not the only one. Again, 12 people died this year worldwide because of taking selfies. There are people who take them on train tracks, and the train comes without them realizing it. I, I know what some of you are thinking, Darwin Award and all that, right? But 
But imagine, like, I, I don't want to make the story too sad, but they're on a trip. They're at the Taj Mahal, and they're taking a picture, and then the guy falls off, and then dies. Like, oh, my God, what did you do? But my point is, for God's sake, please, that picture is not that important. Everybody's obsessed with pictures. So I, mean, I like pictures. It's not an anti-picture rant. The other day I was looking through old pictures of my kids, and I was like, oh, that's so cute. I'm glad we took those pictures. What well, bounds of reason? Don't do it with a train coming. I, I, look, here's the only thing you have to take into consideration in any situation that you find yourself in. Just know your surroundings. Know your surroundings and don't put yourself in a dangerous situation. You don't need to take pictures on the train tracks. You can take a picture near the train tracks and get the train tracks in the background if you really want it. But just be careful. Know your surroundings. It's okay to take these pictures. It's okay to, people call you narcissistic, let them call you narcissistic. I don't care about any of that. The only thing that matters is that you are in a safe place when you take them and you know your surroundings. Yeah, and some people are falling into dangerous equipment. Don't take selfies near a wood chipper, okay? Like, don't, just please have some common sense. And most importantly, though, it's mainly the falls, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're in a place that, like, oh, look at that one video. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. Remember that one time I told you I was going, uh, we went hiking with a bunch of friends. We get to the top of the mountain. Top of the mountain, there's a little trench, the very top, right? And there's one little thing to hang on to, but if you slip, there's no safety net. You're going to fall off the mountain and die. And everyone's like, oh, let's go to the top. I was like, not me. Okay, I'm going to yeah. go get some hot cocoa. Because you know why? I'm a spaz. I trip a little bit. Uh, in real life, I twist my ankle. I'm going to be all right in a couple of weeks. I tri trip over there. I'm dead. So, hot cocoa. Remember, everybody, hot cocoa. All right. A woman in Dearborn, Michigan, has received a $40,000 settlement after she was pulled over by a police official and given a ticket because she has AIDS. Or I should say HIV. Sorry about that. So, um, the woman here is... Chalandra Jones, and according to uh, reports, during a routine traffic stop, the police officer, David Lacey, discovered medical marijuana in the woman's car along with an expired medical marijuana card. He then berated Ms. Jones when she finally told him that she was HIV positive. According to The Independent and also the Detroit Free Press, the officer said that he did not want to take any diseases home to his family and that Dearborn does not have that many people living with HIV and the police do not like people with HIV. Also, he said, honestly, if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would have wrote anybody for anything, meaning the ticket, but that kind of really aggravated me. You know what I mean? You got to tell me right away because you've got to tell me right away because at the time I wasn't wearing any gloves. So this officer obviously shows his insane ignorance when it comes to something like HIV. You're not going to get HIV by writing someone a ticket or by simply talking to them. And also, that stigma is so freaking pathetic, right? Because, first of all, I know what it is. He's probably thinking, oh, she's, she's promiscuous, or she probably did something to get this. You don't know how she got it. And even if she was promiscuous, to treat someone with HIV like she's a piece of shit, which is what he did, is not okay in any circumstance. He should be fired, but he hasn't been suspended or reprimanded in any way at all. So, it goes to the same theme, actually, as a lot of the police abuse stories that we cover, which is the cops don't want to take any chances with their well-being. No chances whatsoever. So, that's why sometimes you'll see them... Like, I, I know a, a personal story. A friend of mine uh, got punched by a homeless guy, right? Now, you'd think that's when they'd spring into action, right? They're like, uh -huh, let's go get him, right? Well, they don't want to get dirty. So they told my friend, like, oh, I didn't see it. If I didn't see it, then it doesn't, it's, it'll be hard to prosecute. So just walk it off. <laughs> okay. So, and, and they think, I don't know, that guy could have a needle somewhere, et cetera. Now, on the other hand, oh, okay, I didn't see a gun, but I, you were coming towards me, so I shot you, right? It's the same idea. You're like, oh, my God, it's somebody i got to deal with. Oh, they got HIV. They just, the people I occupy, they're such a pain in my ass, right? And they put me in danger. And that's the number one thing you can't do. You can't disrespect the police, and uh, you can't put them in any kind of danger for their well-being at all. That's when they'll come to get you. And he says it here. I would have let you go otherwise, but, you know, you're represented, you know, a tiny, tiny uh, possibility that you might affect my well-being. So you have a life-threatening illness, and as a result, I'm going to write you up. 
right? Let me add insult to injury. And by the way, let, can we just have a federal law that legalizes marijuana so we can stop putting people in situations like this? She didn't need to disclose anything, okay? She had no reason to disclose anything to this cop, but the cop finds the marijuana. She had a license for it, but the license had expired. And so she felt the need to tell him what her condition is so he could understand why she had the marijuana. I don't care if she had the marijuana because she likes to smoke it recreationally. As long as she's not high while she's driving, I'm totally fine with that. We need to finally pass a federal law legalizing marijuana for recreational use and just be done with it. This is such a crazy story. I feel terrible for this woman. And lastly, um, you see, the attitude is not like, oh my God, you have HIV, are you okay? Because I'm concerned about you as another human being. The attitude is, your life doesn't matter to me at all. You got HIV, that's your problem, not my problem. The minute you make it a 1% likelihood that it's my problem, that's when I'm going to come down on you. And th these are the people that are supposed to be keeping us safe, right? They seem to care <laughs> so much about the community they're serving. That's sick. Anyway, she did receive a $40,000 settlement. I just wish that cop got fired. He did not. All right, moving on. An Oklahoma teacher is facing some ridicule after she demonized a four-year-old for being left-handed. Uh, Four-year-old Zaid went to Oaks Elementary School in Oklahoma, and apparently when he was writing with his left hand, the teacher confronted him about it. According to the boy's mother, she says, I asked, is there anything his teachers ever said about his hands? And he raises the left one and says, this one's bad. Now, apparently she noticed that he was doing his homework with his right hand, and he was really struggling because he doesn't write with his right hand. And so she looked into it a little bit and found out, oh, so my kid got ridiculed because he was writing with his left hand. Uh, San sent her son's teacher a note, and she replied with a copy of an article that described left-handers as, quote, unlucky, evil, and sinister. <laughs> the, the stuff people believe is unbelievable. Like, she's gone through, she's an adult. She's a teacher of children. Yeah. She's gone through her whole life believing, like, if she sees somebody writing left-handed, ooh, watch out for that one. Sinister. She even, the, the article even said, for example, the devil is often portrayed as left-handed. Oh, well, they, okay, then. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Well, that's good hard evidence. What's, what's, what's wrong with us? Now we're picking on kids. Yeah. Now we're picking on kids. That's, that's the society we live in. And Oklahoma, that's not okay. Okay. Uh, so, here's the interesting part of the story, other than this woman's insane, and a lot of people support her. Like, so, the, she didn't get suspended. She's, the school's appears to be largely backing her. Yeah. It's Oklahoma, though. She's, but I didn't, look, the, the depths of their ignorance, uh, I, I really didn't know it. I, I didn't know how ignorant they were. Like, if you told me, like, hey, the pe good people of Oklahoma will back up a teacher who thinks you're sinister and evil if you're left-handed, I said, come on. And I, hey, come on, you lips, bring it down. They're, they're not that bad. Okay, I stand corrected. So here's the interesting part, though. I did not know that the left had such a stigma throughout. I knew that being left-handed, sometimes people thought that there was something wrong with it. I'd heard that at some point in my life. Uh, I thought it was Do so... Do people think it's a disability or something? I don't know, but they... So, but it turns out it's, it's, got, it's rooted in the language. So the Latin word for left is sinistra, which means sinister. Yes. Okay, wow, that's weird. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon word is Lyft, uh, which is not just a car company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's spelled with a Y. It is, mm -hmm. just like Lyft, and, uh, which apparently means weak. In Sanskrit, completely different language, it, Lyft means wicked. So why hasn't Oklahoma outlawed Lyft from operating there? I don't know, maybe they have, I haven't looked into mm, it. Right? That's a good point. Uh, so... I don't know why that's the case, but it is interesting. I don't know if that has seeped into the politics at all, but the left in politics is often called weak, mm -hmm. less holy, less religious, etc. And the right is like, strong and we are with God. Yeah, that's interesting. It's fascinating. I don't know on what subconscious level that might have affected us as a society, but, uh, but here it is very much a real thing that they are charging against a four-year-old. I charge you with being left-handed, sinister little four-year-old. I just love this trend of going after kids, right? So, like, last week, it's a 14-year-old Muslim kid who creates a clock. This week, it's a four-year-old kid who's left-handed. What, what, what's going to happen next week? Is it an infant that didn't have enough hair on its head when it was born? Well, actually, it's funny you mentioned hair, 
because earlier in the week we didn't get to a story where it was a kid with a mohawk in Utah. They threw him out of school, except it turns out he was a mohawk. He wasn't necessarily exactly a Mohawk, but he's Native American. Yeah. And it is part of his tradition, his tribe's traditions, to wear that hairstyle. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. get the fuck out. No, okay. To be fair to them, they didn't say get the fuck out. They called his parents, and they're like, you got to pick him up. He's breaking the dress code. And then when the parents explained that it was part of their tradition, they decided to just let it go. No, but they required a note from the tribal leaders. Yeah. They didn't believe the tribe ID card that the parents had. Just trust the parents. How about they're not, that? They're not making up that they're Native Americans. They're not making that up. Nobody makes that up. <laughs> okay. All right. One uh, final story for you guys. Except for the war. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Obscure political. Syracuse University has decided to ban their kiss cam, or at least suspend their kiss cam indefinitely, after people complained about the kiss cam leading to sexual assaults. All right. So... Let me give you some more details on this. This is really interesting. Uh, the Mets team also recently decided to stop pointing the kiss cam on members of the opposing team. They would do that as a joke, like, hey, hey, here's two dudes from the opposing team. Kiss, kiss. And then people got really upset about that because they thought it was homophobic, and they decided, all right, we're no longer going to do that. But Syracuse is now suspending the kiss cam indefinitely because they think that it forces people to be physically active or, or physical when they don't want to be physical, okay? Mm -hmm. So, according to reports, the university suspended the kiss cam from the Carrier Dome, where it plays home games, after fans complained that the tradition promotes, quote, male entitlement and unwanted sexual advances. During the kiss cam, this is coming from Steve Port, who was complaining about it, during the kiss cam break at the Syracuse game last weekend, I saw some horrifying behavior that was met with cheers and applause from the crowd. It made me sick to my stomach. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now, I think a lot of conservatives are going to be super mad at Steve Port, and they're going to call him names, like social justice warrior, all that nonsense, right? I think he probably has the best of intentions. But um, but i got to ask Steve to calm down a little bit, right? So, <laughs> an overwhelming majority of the time, it is people who are, are in together, relationships, right? Yeah. Uh, like the president and, and Michelle, Michelle Obama, Obama, they did that recently. Uh, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter did it recently. So you know, you're familiar with this, right? And so, and people get a big kick out of it. And then later, Biden and, and Malaya. No. That's oh. I don't even know. Is that Sasha or Malaya? I don't know. Sasha, okay. Okay, okay. You know what, Biden? No, later he whispered in her ear. Okay. Probably, he probably did. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so, and if they do an inappropriate one, you don't actually have to do it. Right? Yeah. And it's not horrifying. That, and, and don't include words like male privilege, right? Uh, male entitlement. Male entitlement. No, okay. I'm, you're being way too nice. Really? really? I get it. He does have good intentions, right? He's, he's looking out for people who might feel uncomfortable with this. And I get the whole point about pointing it to two men and then, like, you know, trying to make a joke out of it. And that is, there is a, an element of homophobia to that. I get that, right? But here's what happens when two people don't want to kiss. I've been to only about 58 baseball games this year. Uh, and the Dodgers do the same thing with the kiss cam, where they point it to random people in the audience. When people don't want to kiss, they just they laugh and they go, no, I don't want to. And then they move on. They point it to someone else. Don't suspend it indefinitely. Keep doing it. But as soon as someone implies or indicates that they don't want to kiss, then you just move on. It's not that big of a deal. So does it mean that it's male entitlement or sexual assault every time a guy goes out on a date with a girl, and he tries to kiss her, and she decides she doesn't want to kiss him back? Is that sexual assault? Come on, man. Like, I just, I feel like we're going too far. Everybody calm down. I, I feel like in 10 years, not 10 years, 5 years, we're not going to have any fun anywhere anymore. So now, again, I, I'm, I, I'm more in the middle here. First of all, I'm annoyed by the kiss cams. We've done it a thousand times. It's so schlocky. I love the kiss cams. Really? I love it. I think it's oh, fun. I think it's so cute. Cheesy. I think it's cute. You're I like a dork. it. It's fun. You're a nerd. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so every time you're at the game, the kiss cam. There we go again, right? And it always ends on two guys. And it look. I'm not overly sensitive about that stuff. But the last time I was at a at a basketball game and they did it with the two guys and they stayed there and everybody laughs. Oh, I was like, that's getting awkward. 
Well, right. I get it, which is why I think it's important that as soon as two people indicate that they do not want to touch each other, then you move on, right? Except the kiss cam almost always stays there even longer when that happens. Okay, so then, all right, change that policy. Don't ban it indefinitely. I agree with you. I agree with you. So the, the proper way to handle this is to the kiss cam operators. I know we've gotten really detailed here. But, like, hey, dude, they don't want to do it. Move along. Move yeah, along. exactly. And, like, okay, like, don't do the gay joke every time. Okay, I mean, I don't know. Space it out a little bit, yeah. right? So, like, I, we're trying to be reasonable here. Um, and, and then a lot of people will be like, oh, no, you're over-regulating. You know, we like the gay joke at the end. We like it when they do <laughs> Like, don't, no, no, just don't make it awkward. Like, don't make it PC, like, yeah. no kiss cam ever again on the planet because it's male entitlement. Also, don't make it awkward. Let's all I, be cool. I totally agree with that. Um, and look, I think that we should also ban uh, the dancing cam which happens quite a bit as well, right? Oh, really? like, like where the camera will focus on someone who's having a really good time at the game, and then that person will stand up and they'll start dancing and gyrating. I feel assaulted when someone's gyrating next to me. Uh, and so I think we should also ban that. And you know what? Why don't we ban... I you no, for like half a second. Let's also ban sporting events because sometimes the guys are really hot, and they, especially at baseball games, wear those really tight pants, and I can see they're junk, and it turns me on, and I, I feel uncomfortable. Uh, awkward. Right? It's, it's awkward, awkward it's and entitled. let's just ban it. <laughs> Ban it. <laughs> you can't just ban everything because Although some people are uncomfortable by it. That's why I partly believe you. I would ban dancing at all. Get out of here. I would ban dancing at concerts because that's awkward. Okay, and if you're at a basketball game. You're awkward. You're awkward. <laughs> you're awkward. <laughs> if you're at a, a basketball game, hey, we're trying to watch basketball here, okay? So it's not for dancing. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> During breaks, and in basketball, they take only about 28 billion breaks. Oh, oh, time out, time out, time out. Time, play the fucking game. Play the fucking game. <laughs> time I think out. There's some chance. There's 30 seconds left in the clock. Just fucking play the game. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I like how Anna turned out to be the Allen Iversons of, uh, of time out. Time out? What you talking about time out? That's what we're talking about. Time out. <laughs> Some chance we went on a little tangent there. I know, I know. Okay. That was fun, though. Okay, all right, fun story for everybody. Uh, all right, post game. What crazy shit are we going to do today? Only God knows. I forgot one oh. thing, though. We want you guys to chime in uh, for this poll, okay? So the Syracuse University poll, we asked you what you think about the kiss camp. Do you think that we should get rid of it? Uh, the answers are either yes, kiss off kiss cam, or no, more PDA, please. So far, uh, 68% of you agree with me, and I like that. Well, that woman in the, on the right-hand side looks to be the aggressor in that case. I wonder if that's a case of female <laughs> entitlement. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so uh, this month, if you uh, subscribe to become a member, you get a free copy of Mad as Hell DVD. This is the month to do it. And yesterday's uh, post game uh, was bananas. Yeah, it was. We mm. talked about porn. Okay. Uh, international porn. You know what? I, you know, I'm going to follow it up with uh, more bananas. Okay. Okay. Uh, yesterday we had German, Japanese, and American porn. Uh, today in the post game, I'd like to uh, dive a little bit more into Russian, Indian, and uh, one one other kind of porn. What was it? Okay, we'll we'll dive into international porn. We'll we'll do the IHOP of porn mm -hmm. and see what we come up with. Okay. Uh, tytnetwork.com slash subscribe. Bye-bye.